Hello, everybody who's watching this right now. Um, we've got an interesting conversation coming up uh, with a couple cool folks. So first, um, I'm Alex Rose, uh, Associate Editor of Coral Magazine and also uh, Amazonas. Uh, and then we've also got with us Mark and Bob. So if you guys both want to introduce yourselves, that would be awesome. I'm Mark uh, Levinson, and I am the Executive Editor of Coral Magazine as of this week. <laughs> so all the pressure is on to do good things like this one right now. Cool. And Bob. I'm Bob Likens. Uh, Alex, Mark, thanks for having me on. I sure appreciate it to, uh, to talk about this. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Pet Advocacy Network. Great. Well, let's start there. Tell us about Pet Advocacy Network and what you do and what you guys do overall. Sure. Um, we are a uh, we're a trade association. We're a membership organization uh, that represents the uh, legislative and regulatory issues that affect the responsible pet trade. So there are there are several different uh, associations out there within the pet space. We are by far the broadest of them. Our members would include everyone from uh, breeders and, and collectors to transporters to retail stores to the folks that make the uh, the products that uh, you then purchase for the pets. So we are we are very broad based and uh, and do exclusively the regulatory and legislative work uh, for that industry. Right. All right. Thanks for the summary. So obviously we're here today based on our backgrounds to talk about Bangai Cardinals. So if you want to give us kind of a, a quick rundown about current issues surrounding them and proposed regulations that are about to possibly go into effect soon, hopefully not, maybe just give us a background about what's going on. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, this one uh, this one has kind of uh, been scary. The Benga Cardinal fish got listed several years ago on the um, uh, under the Endangered Species Act as a threatened species. Uh, there was a lot of contention about it when it was done. Um, there, there are a lot of different opinions on it. Uh, a lot of the science said that it wasn't really necessary, but be that as it may, it was listed. Uh, <clears throat> when something is listed as threatened, uh, the agency that's responsible for, for managing or overseeing um, that species then has the option of writing what's called a 4D rule. Uh, a 4D rule basically lays out the terms for trade in the species. Uh, if it's listed as endangered, often there can't be any trade in the species, or it can be. It has to be very limited and for conservation purposes, things like that. Uh, in this case, with a threatened species, there's more latitude because it's a much lower bar to cross to be listed as threatened than to be listed as endangered. Um, over uh, several years, no 4D rule was written on this, uh, so there was no specific guidance. Uh, and then NOAA um, did a uh, did a periodic review, a five year review on the species, and I'll just say use that to justify writing a uh, a proposed 4D rule that they just put out that um, would essentially ban all trade in the species into and out of the U.S. Um, it's it's a huge thing, and because the Bengay cardinal fish is is one of the most common saltwater um, fish for uh, for Aquarius. Yep. So a little bit just, I guess, about um, range of Bangai's. Of course, they initially come from the Bangai Islands. That is their endemic range. Um, I know the initial concern was that they were being over collected there, but there are, of course, lots of other locations around the region that they've established themselves, as well as the fact that the vast majority of them coming into the trade right now are actually captive bred, aren't they? Yeah, you're hitting the nail on the head. It's uh, it, the the species within its native range legitimately was under pressure. This is sure. why Saini spent several years uh, talking about it within the Animals Committee. Uh, but the CITES Secretariat, along with um, uh, several other governments that helped fund it, spent a lot of time working with Indonesia to develop a management plan and put that plan into effect. Um, as you said, uh, this is something that people like CITES, people like uh, NOAA recently suggested might be a problem. The aquarium trade actually saw this as a potential problem years, if not decades ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and because of that, a couple of things were done. On the 
less sciencey end, uh, you talked about those those non-native populations. Uh, basically, when a uh, when the people would go to the different islands and collect the fish from the fishers, they put them all on their boat and then go to the next island, pick up some fish, put them on their boat. Well, every once in a while, they'd stop at an island and dump out a bucket of fish. And now you have new populations. Um, it doesn't sound like there are any cases where it displaced a, uh, a native species, so it wouldn't actually be considered invasive. It would just be considered non-native. Because uh, then we'd have a whole new set of headaches. Right. Oh, God, yeah. But uh, <laughs> but it means that there are a lot of what are essentially farmed populations out there, too. Mm -hmm. So none of the fish are collected or very few of the fish are collected within the native range of this species anymore. Uh, the other thing that was a little bit more science-y that uh, the trade did was set up a very successful aquaculture uh, uh, industry around this. Um, mm -hmm. They basically 120,000 Bengay Cardinals a year come into the U.S. That's been a pretty stable number over the last decade. All of those, one, one importer brings in 100,000 of those, so the vast majority. Wow. All of his come from one aquaculture facility. So there is no problem meeting uh, demand with the aquaculture fish. In fact, the, the aquaculture facility will tell you they could double production if there was actually a demand for it. So um, this is this is NOAA with a solution in search of a problem. I was going to say, I don't really understand what the problem is. And you just said there is no problem. I'm, how are you? OK, you said earlier that they ignored the science. And, you know, the data. Well, if we can't rely on science and data, what can we rely on? I mean, now we're down to feelings. I mean, what's happening here? Well, I mean, that that's what it looks like to me. And in this case, because NOAA is the agency asking for the 4D rule, um, I think NOAA is setting itself up to get sued because their mandate in their charter actually says they have to make science-based decisions. Mm -hmm. And I cannot imagine what they're using to base that on i've read their five-year review i've read the and it's it, it it's it's frustrating it it throws a lot of data out there but the data really doesn't support what they're trying to do it takes a little bit different angle than conservationists come uh traditionally have um as alex brought up the uh the good practice or the best practice generally is to be concerned about the status of a species within its native range. Mm -hmm. uh, their five-year review spends a lot of time talking about these um, these established populations, um, which makes very little sense, particularly with the Bangai, because it looks like the different populations, native populations of this species, have been uh, have always been isolated. It was never a broadly um, uh, scattered fish throughout the islands mm -hmm. and that's based on a little bit of dna um, data that's been collected mm -hmm. if that's the case then these these non-native populations are going to be mixed dna and are not going to be the same thing you'd be protecting anyway so it's it just it it baffles me why they went this direction um you know, I'm sure everybody out there uh, who's done anything with aquarium fish knows who Dr. Andy Ryan is. Uh, he's he's actually done research for us looking at uh, trying to develop a test to detect the illegal use of cyanide in collecting fish. Dr. Ryan is is quoted three or four times in their um, in their five year review, but they wouldn't talk to him while they were writing the rule. Uh, and it just it makes no sense to me. So uh, I am I, I am more than a little frustrated with this one, but uh, but I think we have a lot of ammo to push back with if uh, if we can get the trade and the hobby engaged on this. Yeah, that I guess that would be the next step in figuring out what to talk about here is what can people do? You know, like what what are our options at this point? Because I know there's a, a closing date for public comments and things that's rapidly approaching. Um, and yeah, what can we do? 
Yeah, you're you're right. Um, we we put on an alert, and this is this is the challenge with being you know a, a small organization with a lot of different sectors that we represent. Um, we put out an alert on this, in which we basically describe the problem, um, given folks some bullet points they can use toward drafting a letter, writing comments to Noah on this, and then I've just uh, provided the link for how to do that and where to do that. So if you go to my website, petadvocacy.org, you can find the alert on the Bengay Cardinal fish. It'll take you no more than two or three minutes. Uh, put put something together, send it in to Noah, get your comments in. Um, the other thing we've been discussing is trying to get a, a uh, an informal hearing on this. Informal hearings are something that the agency does not have to do, but it is permitted to do. Mm -hmm. uh, if we can get a hearing on this, I, I think we can make it very clear that the science does not support this proposed rule. Can you clarify something you said earlier? Because um, it might help with the discussion, especially with people writing in. I wrote mine in like a week ago. Uh, I was just like, this makes no sense. They were in danger 10 years ago. We fixed it. And um, you said, okay, so there's the native area where they were known from. And then they dropped out of buckets into other spots where they don't belong. Are they being collected from those spots is what you were saying, plus all the 120,000 aquacultured fish that are being uh, grown yes. inside captive bred tanks? Yes. Uh, there is little or no collection actually going on within the native range anymore. So the native uh, range is safe. Yes, and, and closely managed by the Indonesian government. Mm hmm Okay, I rest my case. We're done. We win. <laughs> I, I get it. it you, you, you read this and you you do just what you did, the polar bear salute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it's true. It really doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, especially when you look at, I, and it's this classic of other parts of Indonesia too. I mean, there are much larger environmental threats to many of these small native range fish species than aquarium collecting. And this is another case, I think, of us just being the easiest scapegoat for being like, this isn't doing well. Let's blame these guys. Yeah, and we're, we are, there are we much are bigger not, problems. Yeah, we don't produce the, the the kind of dollars that the food fish industry does. So exactly. nobody's going to go after them. Exactly. Uh, the, the frustrating thing, though, is this aquaculture operation, these aquaculture operations, there are actually several now, um, they bring in a lot of revenue to countries that very desperately need it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I actually, I was talking with somebody about this last week and, and they used a term I hadn't heard before, but it really fits. And that's imperialist conservationism. This is the U.S. deciding they want something listed, even though there is a good system in place that is providing jobs and, and bringing in money to countries that desperately need both. But we don't like it, so we're going to kill it. And if the U.S. does this, then those aquaculture facilities are going to fold in no time. That's what I was about to say. So if they put this ruling into place, then the 120,000 fish that they can raise per year, they can no longer send it to us, correct? Correct. And what about interstate? Would, would this ruling affect transferring things from Florida to Texas? It does not, but these aren't aquacultured in the states. So, um, no, I just meant, you know, with among hobbyists and among fish stores, right, and among, yes, and, could and they even transfer state line? I mean, how far is Noah trying to they, take? This? They can, Noah does not have jurisdiction over that. Uh, that's something Fish and Wildlife Service is trying to get right now through a mm -hmm. bill that uh, Marco Rubio is sponsoring Senate Bill 1614, which would make changes to the Lacey Act and give Fish and Wildlife Service authority over interstate commerce, but. That's wow. that is a separate headache for another day. Okay. All right, all right. <laughs> but no, we don't want to stop the aquaculture facility. That's literally the best choice. Otherwise, we have to take from the ocean. So instead of getting one hundred and twenty thousand from, well, okay. So if Noah did that, then does that mean that you can't even bring in wild caught either? I mean, it's basically saying no bad guys will be allowed in the U.S. ever again. That's correct. Yeah, we'd have to breed them in the states, and that's it. That wow. would be it. And like and you that said, depending it hurts on their economy. Act. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, it could yeah. get messy and nasty real fast. Well, let's let's cross our fingers for informal hearings. <laughs> I think we yes. need some of those. Like Yeah, so how how soon would that be potentially? Uh it, it knows, that probably, I don't but know. it would uh, <laughs> I I think what they would do is at the end of the comment period, which is middle of next month, um then they would make that the decision to hold those hearings or that hearing 
uh, based on the comment they receive. So at some point after they pull the curtain and it goes into its little black box where they make a decision, um, they would come back and say, we've decided to hold uh, an informal hearing on this. So it, it's something I will, you know, happily be beating on their door to uh, to request, but um, the, it's it's very difficult to predict. And worst okay. case scenario, if it does go through, how long does it take to appeal and undo it? Uh, appealing it is, well, I mean, this is, this is a federal reg. It, it would take this whole process again. We would have to convince them that they need to do it. Then they would have to file a proposal to change the 4D rule in the federal register. Then they'd have the open comment period again. Then they'd go back and make another decision based on those comments. The other side of this, though, is if some of the um, businesses within the trade that are affected by this or uh, one business in particular, I, I don't want to name them without uh, without their permission, even though it's giving them credit. Yeah. One business is responsible for, for setting up most of this aquaculture uh, infrastructure. Yeah. And um, after having spent all that money to set it up, I think they would have a good case to go back and say, look, we did this based on the science. Your decision does not follow the science. So the courts could potentially force them to change this one. Uh, mm -hmm. But that would mean someone would have to step up and pursue that. And uh, being tangled up in some court cases right now in Hawaii, I can tell you that is not something we do lightly. Right. No. Yeah, no, I was just no. wondering. Oof. Best to avoid for sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was just looking. I think October 16th is the closing date for public statements. So um, yeah, for anyone who watches this, let's let's please get our comments in sooner rather than later. Yeah, and it's, do what it's we really can on the front end. too that that the hobbyists really move the needle on these things. Yeah. You know, the businesses, you you get a certain it's important to get the, the businesses, especially the small businesses, but uh to a degree. You know, those comments will always be taken with a grain of salt. All they're looking out for their bottom line. Right. The hobbyists are what are really important. Um, mm -hmm. And if if what I said out earlier about the hobbyists sounded in any way dismissive, it is certainly not. Mm -hmm. um, last year, there was a bill uh, called uh, the Lacey Act Amendments Bill uh, that Marco Rubio had offered previously. Some of that language got put into a, a big bill called competes. It was half a page of a 1600 page bill, mm -hmm. but it would have been just devastating for the trade and the hobby. We were a big part of getting that bill killed and getting it changed and getting that language taken out. And it wasn't the industry and it wasn't the businesses as much as it was the hobbyists. We had a, a similar alert set up for that and just our system sent something like 20,000 letters to legislators. And that was hobbyists. That was not businesses. Yeah. So when hobbyists get involved and there are interested parties all across the country, that gets people's attention. So we desperately need the hobbyists to engage on these issues. Definitely. Okay. Well, this seems like a good start. It's at least a, a jumping off point for something we can all do and not just feel helpless in the whole process. Cause that's really not a good place to be. Um, gosh, I mean, I don't know if there's anything else we, we need to cover about this. I guess we'll, we'll probably follow back up with you soon and kind of see oh, where things are headed. Um, and, and what has changed. Um, obviously hopefully this doesn't come to fruition because it seems like it would be a really sort of a, a, a bad baseline to start for other species that this could be implemented with, because once you kind of establish that as the norm, mm, that that's, seems like dangerous that's territory. That's what really worries me about the direction we're seeing things go these days. Yeah. Um, you know, this is such an obvious case of yeah. where captive breeding is doing exactly what it's supposed to be for conservation. So if you can attack this, it, and undermine the most obviously successful example. Yeah. What species is safe? You know, right now, industry is putting a ton of effort and resources into trying to captive breed different types of tangs, which are <laughs> notoriously difficult to mm -hmm. uh, to breed because of yeah. their uh, their life cycle. Uh, where is where is the incentive to do that? 
if it's then going to get listed anyway, and you're not right. going to be able to trade in it, it's yeah. it, it's absolutely crazy. Uh, this is this is the worst <laughs> a, a approach I can think of for for knee jerk conservationism. You would think that instead they would choose to make a ruling that you can't get wild caught ever again, and only aquaculture fish. Um, maybe, but some a lot of those wild caught come from outside the native range. And mm -hmm. if you do want to set up uh, a breeding operation in the states, then you're going to want to bring in as much genetic diversity as you can. So right. you know it. it we could probably live with a rule like that, but I don't think it's in the species' best interest. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's a tough one, yeah. but all right. Well, what's, what's the old saying? For every difficult problem, there's a solution that's simple, elegant, and wrong. <laughs> that seems perfectly accurate for this scenario. Gosh. Um Okay, well, we'll make sure that we provide people with links, um, places that they could check out the information that we discussed and where they can send their comments uh, and hopefully move the needle in the right direction. <laughs> I would love it if every single person that watches this video will take the time to write. Yeah. So if this video gets 2,000 views, it should have 2,000 writes, write-ins. I think that would be a good step in the right direction. I think so. Yes, and please share it with others. Definitely. Maybe, maybe we can collectively put together like a little statement, like a, a one, a one paragraph statement that people could start with if they want to try to submit stuff. Cause sometimes starting submitting comments is the hardest thing. And you tend to get very emotional about these issues as an Aquarist. So maybe we'll put something together and put it out there. So everyone has a place to start. Yeah, That'd be awesome. Good. All right. We'll work on that. <laughs> well, Hey, Mark, Alex, thanks so much for having me. I sure appreciate it. And, uh, as, as you can tell, I'm a little bit fired up about this one, but it just, it, this, this takes stupid to a new level. It really doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, this is, uh, this is not good science and it just doesn't seem like there's any actual purpose for the fish. If, if this were actually going to be helping the fish fine, but it just doesn't seem like there's anything in place to actually do that. So I was shocked. It was even a discussion. I thought, I thought we fixed this a decade ago. Yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> and it, they contacted me, actually, the uh, the gentleman who was doing the economic analysis side of this contacted me last fall, mm. and I discussed it with him, and they said they were going to put out a rule, uh, a proposed rule right away. So we kept waiting, kept waiting. And, you know, I honestly thought they were going to drop it like the Friday before Christmas. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is how you get unpopular things through. Mm -hmm. um, but... Uh, and then it took so long. I'm like, all right, well, I guess they're not going to do it because Fish and Wildlife now has a couple of proposals to get rid of some of their requirements with with doing 4D rules and how they handle, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, endangered and threatened species. So I thought they just dropped the idea. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> boom, it's there. So, yeah. wow. We'll, uh, we will, uh, I'll run around with my hair on fire and try and, <laughs> try and educate folks. Thank no, you for your help with this. Yeah, thank you. And I mean, this just, I think, speaks to the importance of both organizations like yours and journalism and the roles that these can all play in kind of keeping us all informed and educated. Because as pet owners, you don't tend to think that government regulation is going to creep into your aquariums <laughs> so quietly. Um, but And actually not quietly in the last couple of years, but um, it still seems like it if you're not really engaged in paying attention to what's going on. So I think it is within all of our best interest at this point to uh, start paying more attention to regulations and the, you know, the coming changes because uh, Lacey Act, even though we made it through this last bout, that's certainly not going to be the last attempt to do the same thing again and slide in those regulations. So I think we need to be ready for that in the coming years. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I am afraid you're right. I know you I are. <laughs> a lot, but I don't worry about running out of things to do. Certainly not. So yeah, thank you for what you do to keep us all uh, on top of things and where we're going. So yeah. Okay, guys, well, it's been good chatting and we'll circle back around um, and see what else we can do to help. Fantastic. Thank you so much.